everybody. Good morning and welcome to St. Francis Church. Uh, we're starting dead on time today. Uh, I know it's unusual, uh, but uh, my name's Sarah. I'm the lead minister here, and we're starting dead on time because we're joined by Outreach Radio this morning, which is lovely. So a really warm welcome to all our listeners uh, around uh, Hampshire and the South Coast who are listening on the radio. A uh, really warm welcome to you if you're listening on Zoom. It's lovely to see you up on the screen in front of us. And a particularly warm welcome to you as well if you're joining us in the building. It's lovely to have you as well. And we're going to make you shuggle down to the front if you're just coming in. They are good. I, I got a bit of a chuckle from somebody coming in. That's excellent. Isn't it a gorgeous day today? Really feeling like spring is coming, even if we could do with some rain. Um, but it's just lovely to be worshipping on a day like this and to be joining together as church family across lots of different locations. Why don't we say a prayer together as we start our service? Lord God, we welcome you this morning by your spirit. We thank you that though we are worshipping across a number of locations, that we are united in worship of you. May we encounter you this morning. Lord, we pray for those who are in our junior church, for those leading our children and little ones in crash, and we ask that they too might encounter you this morning, uh, that you would bless them as they worship, and that you would bless us too as we meet with you this morning. Amen. Let's join together in the opening words on the screen. I know some of you can't see the words, but you will be able to hear us say them and do feel free to echo them in your heart. So let's say these words together. God, our source and guide and goal, you have made us in your image and set us in a world full of beauty. You dwell in light unapproachable. Yet you have come to be among us, full of grace and truth. You are the power from on high, coming in wind and flame to work your wonders in our midst. Gracious God, awaken us from sleep that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as we come together in worship, it's great to just spend a few moments bringing to God those things that have separated us from him during the week. Um, there's, I've got a long list, I don't know about you, but it's really good just to spend a moment reflecting on those things. So we'll take a moment, quiet, and then please do join with me in the words of confession up on the screen. Let's pray together. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who were once dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is faithful and when we confess the things that we've done wrong and that separate us from him, he promises to forgive us, to wipe the slate clean as we start a new week. And so I can pray for us. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the special prayer for uh, the fourth Sunday of Easter, the collect of the day that said in many churches throughout the world. Let's say these words together. Risen Christ, faithful shepherd of your father's sheep, teach us to hear your voice and to follow your command that all your people may be gathered into one flock to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
We're going to explore that theme a little bit more as we go through our service of Jesus as our Good Shepherd. Uh, But first of all, we're going to sing together and we're going to sing a version of Psalm 23, which you may remember starts off by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn, the King of Love, my shepherd is. Now, some of you will have met our curate, Joe, and some of you won't, but Joe is on placement at the moment. Uh, We've been teasing him, saying he's gone to learn how to do things uh, properly uh, in in a more formal church, and we're hoping he's going to come back and teach us. I know he's having a good time, and they're keeping him really busy. He's back with us uh, in a couple of weeks, I think. I think um, he's probably back in church in three weeks' time. But um, before he went away, he'd do us an interview most weeks uh, with people from the congregation or around the place. And uh, Joe did an interview before he went on placement uh, with regard to Christian Aid. Now, Christian Aid Week, you may well be familiar with. It starts in a week's time uh, on the 15th. And traditionally, people have taken envelopes around to all the houses around and then gone back a week later and collected them. And it's been a really effective way to collect money. But we realise that as time goes on, it's probably not the most effective way and that many of us prefer to just give online. It's just much quicker and easier. And most of us uh, these days don't carry much cash anymore. Is that just me? I was trying to pay, actually, for parking the other day. I just realised I didn't have any cash at all. But luckily, I sorted out the phone app for parking. I am so modern. Uh, But anyway, um, 
if you'd like to give uh, by an envelope, uh, you can still do that. There will also be a link in the newsletter in coming weeks so that you can give online if you'd like to. Um, but Brian Risdale heads up Christian Aid for the Chandler's Ford area, and he and Joe managed to catch up uh, and just tell us a little bit about the work of Christian Aid. Uh, and so let's hear that interview just now. I should let you know that there are some sirens in the background on this interview. Uh, so <laughs> they, I, I thought there was a terrible road traffic accident at the junction by my house, stopped the video and realised it was outside their house. So just so you know, it's on the video. I think you'd be glad I warned you. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Let's have a listen. I was wondering if you could just uh, explain a little bit about who you are yes. um, and, and what Christian Aid is. Thank you. Well, I'm Brian Ridsdale. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, for Christian Aid. I've um, been a volunteer for an awfully long time. Um, I, I worship at St Boniface at St Martin's. And uh, I've worked with some lovely people from St Francis over the years. Yeah, and over the years that you've mentioned, um, St Francis have been giving a portion of their income to Christian Aid. It's one of the charities that we support. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit of where that money goes and what happens to that. Yes, that's brilliant, yes. Yeah, Christian Aid is a charity of uh, 40 uh, major denominations in the UK. Its focus has always been on helping the poorest of the poor and on justice, and that's pretty important. It's not just there to deal with um, emergencies, but mm. rather to try and build a situation where people can get, cope for themselves yeah. and to fight injustice. And injustice comes out through power differences, so it tackles all those things. And it does it through partners. Okay. So this is not... Um, a white missionary coming out to a country and um, uh, saying, I'm here to, uh, you know, from Christian Aid, I'm here to help you. Yeah. Works with partners in the country, okay. many of them from Christian churches, and they know the people they can help and the way to do things and the way to avoid perhaps corruption in certain yeah. places. So that's great. Yeah, okay. And are you able to give me an example of how Christian Aid has helped anyone specifically? Yeah, I'd like to tell you about uh, Janet. Okay. Um, who lives in Zimbabwe and she'd been through some really bad times because of increasing uh, numbers of droughts mm. and she she's been to the situation where she says I thought we were going to starve we didn't have any crops I went out and collected stuff we wouldn't normally eat I knew the children wouldn't eat it so I made it into a porridge and I gave it to them and, uh, and then I took a little bit to give to the dogs and she said when they when they finished theirs and they went for what the dogs have got I really felt that we are at the end Mm. So we did get through it, and she's immensely grateful now. But through the project they're working on, which is a fairly big project in yeah. Zimbabwe, they've been taught how to preserve the types of seed that can grow in dry times. Mm. And they were taught how to plant um, the rice seeds can be better coped with. Yeah. They've been shown how to build storehouses and dry food so that they can carry it over. Right. And a variety of things. In involving education through their own people mm. that they've been able to pass on to their community. Right. So she has lots of grandchildren, she's, uh, she's 70 and great grandchildren, and she's delighted that she could keep them fed with their parents and have enough to store and save and yeah. use for the future. And if you went to see her land, it would be glorious. Brilliant. Probably. So it's really how yeah. God has been working in that area. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she says she praises God for it. Yeah. For, um, the changes that have come to her Absolutely. and her family. Brilliant, yeah. Mm. And um, is there anything for Christian Aid that requires prayer? Uh, yes, obviously Christian Aid would, would love prayer at the moment for, for everything, but particularly, of course, Ukraine, mm -hmm. where Christian Aid is working with the money that uh, we and other people have provided through Christian Aid and through the DEC appeal uh, on the borders. Uh, helping refugees and also inside where they, pro they provided 11,000 uh, survival packs for people who are actually stranded in the country. Uh, hopefully it's very helpful. So prayer for that would be great. Mm. From the point of view of St Francis, we've had a lovely relationship over the past uh, 30 years and it would be really great if, if St Francis could appoint a new Christian Aid rep. Uh, Marion's okay. done a great job for us, uh, various other people in the past. Um, but we do want to do a Christian Aid Week that means something mm. this year. It would be lovely to have somebody else on the committee to work with us. Okay. Thank you. Shall we pray? Yes. Yeah. 
Loving Father, thank you for Brian and his colleagues in Christian Aid and all the work they've done over many, many years. Thank you for stories like that we've just heard about the people in Africa who have struggled with um, their crops in times of drought. Thank you for the, for the work that Christian Aid have been able to do in educating them. We thank you, Father, for the efforts for Christian Aid and other charities that are working together in Ukraine. Be with them, Father, we pray. Give them peace. And we also pray for help with um, Christian Aid. Be, be with us and um, help us to support Christian Aid. Yeah, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I would add a prayer for uh, the staff, but particularly the partners and volunteers who work with Christian Aid, with the people that Christian Aid supports. Give them, Lord, uh, your strength. Mm. In your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lovely. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for seeing me this afternoon. And, thank you. Uh, take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Brilliant. I just want to say thank you to everybody who is going to do some collecting. I know Margaret's here and is, I think she's going to give out envelopes, aren't you? You've got some envelopes. Give all Margaret's going to stand up here and wave at us. You've got some, there she is. Uh, Margaret's got some envelopes for those who volunteered. Uh, so thank you so much for that. If anybody is interested in actually being our rep, then do have a chat with me. Um, it, it would be lovely to have somebody uh, to be able to uh, just carry that work forward and, and be able to speak to us more as a church about the work of Christian Aid. Um, so just let me know if that's something you're interested in. Now, <laughs> I, did, I did say, I thought, I thought I'd mention the sirens in advance so that it didn't distract you, but looking around the room, I don't know how you guys were on the radio or whatever, everybody just chuckled when they started. <laughs> so I don't know if it worked as a means to help you not be distracted. Never mind, I, I chuckled when they started. I thought I might have made it up, actually, so I was almost relieved when they came on and I, I wasn't making it up. Oh, dear. And um, Graham's going to bring us our Bible reading. Graham, I, I, we're just watching the children, actually. I think he's watching his, his children go out the door. The children are off to do something outside this morning, so um, that's fantastic. It's, uh, sorry about the rest of you who can't see them so easily, uh, but it's lovely to watch our young people uh, enjoying their time together this morning. Graham, thank you very much for reading for us. At the time the festival of um, dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in Portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. But you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will, answer, they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given to me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the word of the Lord. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to pop that back up on the screen a bit later on because it's going to help us just to have the Bible reading easily visible. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, many of you know, some of you might not, um, <laughs> others will be asking where you've been if you don't know this, that I grew up in Jersey. I'm a Jersey bean. Uh, tomorrow's our national day, so I'm pretty excited. I'll be cracking open the champagne at some point. It's Liberation Day in Jersey. We celebrate liberation uh, from uh, the German occupation in 1945 on May the 9th. Um, and slightly inauspiciously, I guess, it's shared with the Liberation Day in Russia, isn't it? Um, but there we have it. Uh, but I grew up in Jersey. I grew up with lots of tales of the German occupation, of how uh, my family uh, uh, got through that time. Um, but my grandfather uh, was a, a good Jerseyman, and he would take me and my sister out for walks in the fields behind his house. And he was really into foraging. Uh, it was obviously a really important skill back in the time of the occupation when there wasn't enough food. But he would take me and my sister out, and we'd find sorrel and dandelion for salads in uh, 
autumn, we'd find mushrooms and we'd pick them. Um, he'd find old birds' nests and he'd point out broken birds' eggs and tell us what species they were from. He even had an old uh, LP record of bird noises, bird songs, so you could learn to identify them. I thought this was amazing, but kind of sadly, I never listened to it long enough that I'm a very good uh, bird song identifier now. I kind of regret that. But very often, as we walked through the fields, we'd come across uh, some Jersey cows. Of course, they were Jersey cows. We were in Jersey. And my grandfather would always, whenever we saw a field of cows, he would bend down at the side of the field, pick up a big bunch of grass, and call to the cows. And it went a bit like this. Come here, come here, come on, Come here, come here, come on, And they would always come. They would wander. I know, I, this was incredible to me. The cows would always, without fail, wander over to him and they would let him just rub gently between their horns and he would get me and my sister to do that. It was kind of cute. I can almost feel that lovely sort of rough, but, you know, it's not hard skin. It's like, like a kind of Labrador dog or something. And these cows would seem, seemingly really enjoy this. We'd feed them grass. I mean, you'd feel their rasping tongue on your hands. Um, but they were gorgeous. And of course, I'm very biased, but Jersey cows are the most beautiful in the world. And they've got a lovely temperament, although somebody later told me that they're independent and stubborn, nothing like other Jersey girls. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, move on quickly. Move on quickly. Um, so anyway, skip forward a few years, and uh, I decided to show off uh, my, you know, obviously genetic ability to uh, speak with cows, to be a cow whisperer. And I wanted to show it off to my husband, Cliff, uh, who had moved to the island. So I would uh, go and, you know, we'd find a field of cows, grab the grass. Come here, come here, come on, Come here, come here, come on, And absolutely nothing happened. But uh, I, was not, I was not daunted by this. I think Cliff was a bit embarrassed, but never mind. <laughs> Come here, come here, come on, But no, they were just not going to come. They turned up their noses and they walked the other way. And I've tried this several times and I have never managed to get a cow to come over to me, which is a little bit galling. What on earth did my grandfather have that I did not? Well, the truth is that my grandfather grew up on a farm. He looked after the cows from you know, basically as when he could walk, he started looking after cows. He became a farmer himself, and actually he exported Jersey cows to Canada. So he would be on a boat with these cows, looking after them on the journey over, uh, and caring for them on the long boat rides, and actually subsequently train rides in Canada. He used to talk about that quite a bit. And it was actually in Canada that he met my grandmother uh, and brought her back to Jersey. What he did not know about Jersey cows was not worth knowing. And that meant that he knew exactly what tone of voice to use, exactly how to get their attention, uh, how to call them over. And those cows clearly knew the voice of one with authority, one that they could trust and one who had their best interests at heart. Me, on the other hand, not so much. I was just trying to show off to my husband, which totally failed. Well, there might be some very slight resonances of that tale later in today's reading. But let's uh, start off. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to put up the beginning of the reading for us? Um, it's from John chapter 10. And earlier in that chapter, uh, it's where Jesus tells the people listening that he is the good shepherd. And he unpacks that a bit. But we're a bit later on, and he's still using this theme that he is the good shepherd. But we find ourselves at um, a festival uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. It's winter time. It seems a little odd to be having a story from the middle of winter when we're in this gorgeous springtime, when we're in Easter season. But there we have it. And uh, the festival is Hanukkah, and the Jews celebrate that uh, even now around the time that we celebrate Christmas. And Hanukkah celebrates the liberation of the Jerusalem temple from an invasion by a Syrian king. And it happened about 300 years before Jesus. Uh, and that Syrian king invaded the temple and desecrated it. He dedicated the temple to the god Zeus and he uh, sacrificed pigs on the altar, which I can barely say that without feeling the offense, but the Jews must have been utterly horrified because 
Je uh, pigs were unclean animals, and to sacrifice them in the temple was beyond awful. So uh, a, a terrible, terrible thing had happened. But an uprising led by Judas Maccabeus, you may have heard of him, you may have heard the piece of music called Judas Maccabeus, he led uh, the, um, uh, the uprising that won the temple back. And after three years, the temple was claimed back again for uh, Israel, and it was rededicated, it was reconsecrated to the one true God, the God of Israel. And it's still celebrated today. And so in our reading, Jesus was walking around in the temple. And I wonder if you have a just moment of irony when uh, the people in the temple stop to ask Jesus if he's actually the Messiah. Remembering that this temple has just been, they are celebrating the rededication of the temple to the one true God who dwells in the temple. Here is the one true God in the form of Jesus walking around the temple and uh, at this uh, festival time when they're rededicating the temple, they're going, who are you anyway? Are you really the Messiah? Why can't you just tell us plainly? Um, I suppose, to be honest, to ask that question, who are you anyway, is quite a reasonable question, isn't it? I, I, on the surface of it, it, it seems quite fair. Uh, the Jews had been expecting a Messiah, so uh, there's no problem to, for them to be trying to uh, find one, uh, to be seeing people uh, around doing interesting things, giving interesting teaching, going, mm, I wonder if they're the Messiah. And particularly, the Jews were looking for people to save them from Roman occupation. They expected someone to come in force to do that. But we're only halfway through John's gospel at this point, and actually Jesus has shown them already a huge amount of evidence that he is the Messiah. Earlier in this chapter, as I mentioned, he's explained that he's the good shepherd. He's the one who's come to bring life in abundance, the fullest possible life. They've already seen him heal the sick. They've seen him change water into wine. They, he's explained that he's the bread of life, that he's the light of the world. And that's why Jesus answers their questions quite obliquely. He's not trying to be difficult, but also no amount of reasoning is going to help them see who he is, because they've already seen more evidence than you could ever imagine, but they still don't believe. Could you go on to the next slide, Jeremy? So we're looking at John 10, uh, looking at chapter 26. There we go. So this uh, verse, uh, John chapter 10, verse 26 says, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. You do not believe, he tells these people who are asking him questions, because you do not belong to my sheep. And to understand what Jesus means, we need to move on to the next verse. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus' sheep are simply the ones who hear his voice. So those of us here today, those of us listening on the radio, those of us in the building, uh, we've heard his voice in some sense. We are his sheep. Now, it may be uh, simply uh, some sort of a niggle that there's something to this faith lark. It might be a deep sense of peace as we come and worship Jesus. Maybe it's only in Christianity that we found life makes sense to us. Maybe we can sense that there must be some authority in Jesus. We know that he's trustworthy, even if we can't quite work out how or why. There's a sense of deep calling to deep, and we can't really articulate our reasoning. But it's to us who sense that call of Jesus, that he speaks and assures us that we are safe forever as sheep cared for by the good shepherd. Those who hear Jesus' voice and recognise it as the voice of their shepherd will be safe forever, and even death, which is the last great enemy, can't ultimately harm them, can't ultimately harm us. And Jesus is so confident of this uh, because the guarantee that he gives is, as it says at the end of that verse there, as, of that uh, bit of the reading we had, that uh, the guarantee is his own unbreakable bond of love and union with the Father God. And the fact that the sheep that he owns are the one that his Father has given him. 
And that's why we find this reading here in Easter season. In the light of Jesus' resurrection, we can look back at this passage and see the truth that death has been defeated, just as Jesus talked about. Personally, I don't find it hard to understand why, until they'd seen him resurrected, it was quite hard to really understand what he meant. But we're looking back with that perspective now and understanding the truth that death was defeated as Jesus was uh, risen from the dead. And it just means that our Christian confidence that there is life after death is not just a matter of wishful thinking. It's not a matter of hoping for the best and crossing our fingers. It's actually built firmly on nothing less than the union of Jesus with the Father. It's demonstrated through the events of that first Easter day. And on Easter day here, we thought quite a lot about the evidence that there was for the resurrection. And we agreed that there was a lot. Well, before we think about what this passage is saying to us today, I just want to go back to that verse 26, uh, to those words that Jesus said to the people in the temple who were pushing him to reveal plainly whether he was the Messiah. You do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. Now, Jesus' reply was that he had told them they still not believe. He'd shown them practically, but they still did not believe. There was, it was just not enough for them. Um, and, you know, it is possible to harden one's heart so much that you can refuse to believe what is clearly in front of you. It's not that Jesus gave these people just one chance. He provided so many miraculous moments for them to see evidence of him. Basically, Jesus will chase us to the ends of the earth. He's always looking for us. Remember the story of the prodigal son who's just, the prodigal son disappears. uh, He dishonors his father, but his father uh, doesn't give up on him. He stands there waiting for him to come back, longing, scanning the horizon. And God is like that for each one of us. He never gives up on us. He stands there waiting for us to run to his arms. And yet it is still possible for uh, people to refuse to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. If people choose not to accept Jesus' offer of eternal life, then it's not forced upon them. And I wonder how you feel about that. I think sometimes we can be quite shocked that this God who seeks for us absolutely everywhere, who gives us chance after chance, will at some point say, actually, there are some who will not inherit eternal life. But the truth is that there is actually good news in this because what we see in it is that Jesus will not tolerate evil. He will not tolerate those who absolutely won't have his love anywhere near them. He won't tolerate the atrocities that we see around the world. And there will be a moment when he decides that enough is enough and he will come back and judge that. And you know, Christians are brilliant at judging wrongly, aren't they? It's up to God to judge. But the bottom line is he will never tolerate evil in this world. Far from being frightening, it is a relief to know that God has a plan to deal with all the bad things we see going on in the world, that his kingdom will come in completeness one day. I think sometimes we can react uh, to what we've just read up there Um, that there will be some who uh, aren't in Jesus' sheepfold by thinking, oh my goodness, what about me? Am I going to miss out? Could I miss being in his sheepfold? Um, And the answer is, if you're even worried about it, no, (laughs) no, you've already heard his call. And you cannot be snatched out of his hand. Those who follow Jesus, those who sense his call, uh, cannot be snatched out of the hand of the Father. And that's where I want to start to think about what this passage is saying to us this morning. Uh, I'm a good Anglican on a good day, uh, so I've got three points. Of course, I've got three points. Um, But I just want to remind us firstly that we are held. We are uh, held in the hands of God. And sometimes as followers of Jesus, we can feel a bit flaky. We can feel a bit doubtful. um, But he is holding us. Jesus is holding us in his hands with all the strength that made Jesus rise from the dead. He's got us, and he is not letting go. 
Psalm 139 says this, if I take the winds of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. That is assurance indeed. We cannot be snatched from the hands of Jesus. And secondly, we've got a choice to belong to Jesus's flock, to belong to his sheep. And if you're anything like me, you need to check out the evidence. I'm often saying that. I've got a bit of a sciencey brain. I've got to check out the evidence. But at some point, uh, then we need to make that choice to believe. Jesus said to the Jews in the temple, he had provided them with plenty of evidence, and yet they still refused to believe. I think it's likely that there's not one of us here who's seen as much evidence for Jesus as those people who were talking to Jesus in the temple. You might have read your Bible from cover to cover and still not had the evidence of Jesus standing in front of you as these people did, and yet they still refused to believe. But at some stage, we just need to make a choice. And at this point, if you thought I was going to miss out speaking on skydiving this morning, you are going to be disappointed. Uh, So some of you will know that Cliff and I ended up doing a skydive last Friday, Um, It sounds like it was a bit of an accident. In some senses it was. It wasn't really on my bucket list or anything like that. But a a friend of ours was celebrating a big birthday. She was dying to do a skydive. And being really good friends, Cliff and I said, yeah, of course we'll come with you. That would be great. Uh, I probably didn't think too much about it until I had to write my next to kin on the form. And (laughs) I know, right? And Cliff said to me, well, don't write me because we're in the the same plane. So... (laughs) oh okay this is not going well so I thought oh I better write my sister down so I phoned my sister and said I'm just putting you as my next of kin for the skydive is that all right at which point she freaks out slightly (laughs) she's at work all day and I had to try and tell her well I might not jump till the afternoon she's going well please let me know when you're back down on earth um anyway I had to be fair I'd done a bit of homework I kind of knew this was likely to be safe ish um and you know, we got there at eight in the morning. I was nervous. My breakfast didn't go down very well, I'm not going to lie. But they rushed us through fairly quickly, which was a really good thing. Get the old jumpsuit on, give a bit of training about what to do as you land, where to put your arms. I forgot that anyway in the moment, but never mind. Um, and then you get on a plane, a very small plane, but you've got a parachute, so it's all right. Uh, you get on a very small plane and uh, they strap you to an instructor. So my instructor was a bit of a lunatic. He had shorts on. Uh, which is obvious at 10,000 feet you want your shorts on. Uh, But anyway, he had a helmet on. I kind of thought they were going to give me a helmet. Um, But as Cliff pointed out, if you land without a parachute from 10,000 feet, a helmet's the least of your worries. So anyway, there I was, strapped to my instructor. And you know what? I I just had to make a decision to trust him. I had absolutely, in my view, no choice. I had... I'd looked into it enough, here I was, I'd made my choice, and I was just going to trust him. Getting out of the plane was a little bit hairy, because they sort of said, oh, whiplash, all this and that. So I was a little bit nervous getting out of the plane, I might have shut my eyes a little bit. But once I was in the free fall bit, I just thought, well, I might as well go with it. Beautiful view. And I just, I actually relaxed quite a bit, and just enjoyed the rides. And once they pull the parachute, it's actually a lovely ride down, the view was awesome. Um, And I I just made that decision to trust. And it was a good decision because it felt very safe when we landed, when we landed. Of course, it felt safe when we landed. (laughs) But but actually, actually, it was absolutely fine. And it was that decision to trust that was important. Deciding to believe. Once we've made that decision to believe, to trust in Jesus, our good shepherd, it really gets a bit easier because the doubt will still come. Of course, the doubt will still come. But it just makes sense. We can walk with him. We can believe in his promises. And we know that he's got us. He's holding us in the palm of his hands. We just need to live it. Finally, we've all sensed Jesus's voice this morning. I don't think many people hear the audible voice of Jesus. Imagine if you did, it'd probably freak us out pretty badly, wouldn't it? But most of us have had a little niggle somewhere in our inner being, uh, a little niggle that there's something in this lark. And that is the call of God. That is the call of Jesus. It's his voice. Remember my grandfather, he wasn't a shepherd. He wasn't a good shepherd, but he was a very good herdsman. He knew cows. He loved cows and he cared for them. 
And they came when he called. They followed him because he had the knowledge and love and care. And that gave him an authority that I just could never have. He knew and loved them and cared for them. The cows weren't distracted by my voice in the least. I just had no authority or trustworthiness. I just wanted to show off. So I wonder this morning if we are distracted by voices that lack the authority of Jesus. I am distracted by so many things. I'm distracted by the slightly overwhelming to-do list sometimes. I'm distracted by a bit of Facebook on the side and just can just lose, you know, I can lose 10 minutes when I didn't really mean to. I am distracted by so many things and they can seem so important sometimes. It's so much more important. There's more important things than social media that can be extremely distracting. But as we seek to follow Jesus's voice, we will find rest in his presence. We can know his provision and his guidance. I wonder if you've managed to find the space to listen to him. There was that brilliant prophet Elijah. I'm, I really like Elijah because he got really fed up. He got too tired. He worked too hard. And then he just had a sulk with God and said, I've had enough. I'm just going to lie down and give up. And I wonder, there might be days that we all feel like that. And God just said, listen, have a rest. And then I'm going to take you up the mountain where I revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses, where I pitched up and had dinner with all the elders back then. And I'm going to reveal myself to you. And I wonder what Elijah was thinking. I wonder if he was thinking, super, I could get, get to have dinner with God like they did back in the day. I wonder if he thought, thunder and lightning again, because that's what had happened when the Ten Commandments were given. But God put him in a cave and said to him, just wait, I'm going to pass by. And there's a thunderstorm and God wasn't there. There was a mighty wind, a rushing wind. God wasn't there. There was a fire, but God wasn't there either. And then there was stillness. And it was in the stillness that God passed by. And that's where we find him today. It's in the stillness. I know it feels weird. I know it's counterintuitive. But we need to give that time if we want to hear the voice of the shepherd to go seek him in the stillness. So I commend that to all of us to go and seek God in the stillness. We've got a service here at six this evening. It's a very informal service of worship and prayer. And we're going to just uh, give a bit of time to seeking God's voice Uh, We're going to just talk a little bit more practically about how that can look. But uh, as we seek to hear his voice, just that warning, not a warning, but just to say, we can never know 100% that it's the voice of God, but that's fine. We just need to work out, is it in line with what Jesus might say from what we know of him from the Bible? Can we talk to a trusted friend who can guide us and know if Uh, It does sound like Jesus. But above all, we need to take the risk and trust that when we hear something that's in line with uh, his voice, we need to take the risk, trust him, and follow him. So that's my encouragement to you this morning, that you would take some time to seek some space with God, to sense his voice in your life, and then to take the risk and act on what you sense he might be saying to you. If you'd like uh, to talk more about that, then you're more than welcome. As I say, six o'clock tonight, there'll be the opportunity to practice in a little more detail. um, But it's a great opportunity to sense more of him. I find that I sense God's presence, particularly uh, both in nature. uh, That's always a great place to go and find the presence of God uh, out in creation, um, but also in sung worship. And I think we can sense God's presence in sung worship because Many of the distracting voices are gone and we're focusing on worshipping Jesus alone. And sometimes that's when we can just have a little sense that he's there with us. He is there with us, we know it. But sometimes we can sense that more deeply in sung worship. And we're going to sing very shortly. We've got two songs of worship, just an opportunity both to worship God, but also to seek to hear his voice. Why don't we pray together? Lord God, thank you that you hold us in the palm of your hand. We pray that you might increase our sense that you are holding us. Would you help us to just put our trust in you? Would you grow our faith in you as our good shepherd, leading and guiding? 
And we ask that as we seek more of you, as we draw near to you, that we might know you drawing near to us. That is your promise to us. Lord, we pray that we might know that in greater measure today and going forward. Amen. And so let's stand and sing together. We've got two songs, The Goodness of God and Raise a Hallelujah. Let's stand as we sing.
Amen. Good sentiment to finish on. The king is alive. Uh, hallelujah, you're meant to shout back, right? Let's try it again. The king is alive. Hallelujah. <laughs> nice, well done. Um, do you have a seat? And um, we're going to, Katie's going to bring us our intercessions. Thank you very much, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for this morning, for being alive, for being here together and on Zoom and on the radio. Thank you so much for the beautiful picture of you being our shepherd and us being your sheep. We pray that we will take time each day to rest with you beside still waters, to listen to your voice, and to know that you walk with us even through very dark valleys. We pray that we will choose to trust in you. We pray this morning for those who are not yet aware of your love for them, or who might feel very far from your love and in dark and unsafe places. We pray for those who are harming themselves in whatever way that may be. For those who are in threatening relationships, maybe domestic abuse or exploitation, trafficking, modern slavery, and are being harmed by others. And our hearts are very much feeling and thinking of those in Ukraine. Father, we continue to call out for you to protect those who are in huge danger of death. We thank you for those who have managed to escape from the steelworks in Azovostal. We pray for those who are still trying to escape to safer parts of Ukraine and other countries. Father, we pray also that there will be a way, which seems very difficult, but a way of dialogue restarting between those in conflict. Thank you that you can do what seems impossible. And we pray that you'll encourage us to keep praying and not give up hope. We pray for Ukraine and many other parts of the world. We thank you for the work of Christian Aid and for the week coming when we focus on them. We pray for our hearts to be touched and our hands to be open to give. We pray that you will challenge us in our complacency when we are often part of systems that deny other people the basics they need to live when we have so much. We thank you for everyone working here and the partners in other countries to bring justice into action. We pray for all the people that are being, uh, well, facing challenges through climate change and drought and flooding. We pray for the renewal of determination for all the actions and changes which we need to make to stop climate change continuing. We pray that you'll bring it back onto our radar and, and the leaders and influences in our world. Locally, we pray for the delivery of envelopes. We thank you for Jeff and Margaret here coordinating that. And we pray for the big breakfast at the Methodist Church next Saturday and the, the services on Sunday evening. We pray for our own country and particularly for people taking up posts after the local elections. We pray for changes in leadership that have happened in Northern Ireland following their voting in the assembly there. And for changes in leadership in Hong Kong and continue to pray for the situation there for all those who are concerned about what's happening. Lord, we pray for all leaders to take courage to be part of the movement towards your justice and peace in your world.
Father, we pray for our church here, knowing so much that we are like a flock of sheep needing to follow you. Thank you that although we are sheep, we are each unique, different sheep, and we pray that you'll help us to listen how you want us to be, what you want us to do, especially to be sharing your love with the people living around us here, day to day, moment by moment. We pray for the reaching out through the cafe, through contacts with the school, the doctor's surgery and the GP chaplaincy, for the house groups, for the children's work. And we continue to pray for the new children and families worker appointment and the shortlisting this week. Father, we also pray ahead for the um, preparations for the Valley Park Life Festival in June and for the chance to invite people to enjoy that celebration. And we pray for our through the roof roof breakers focus here, just to be aware of valuing people, whatever our different abilities or gifts are. In our cycle of prayer, we're praying locally for those who live in Fairburn Close, Larkspur Drive and Collins Close. Maybe we should just take a few moments to hold before God ourselves as part of your flock and others that we're praying particularly for. And in our prayer chain, we're praying particularly for the family of Florence, who is having major treatment at Great Ormond Street. Lord, she's like a little lamb, really. <laughs> she's so young. Um, we pray for her. We pray for Jess and Tom and her sister Lucy. We pray for Margaret recovering from a fall and we're holding two particular families in our congregation who are grieving. For the Reeves family mourning June, we pray for Graham and his sister Karen and Debbie and all the boys and the family and thank you for the life of June. And we're praying this morning for Sally Harfield and her family mourning the loss of Sally's husband Mike who died peacefully at home yesterday. We just have a few moments to hold anyone particular to, to God's love. We're just going to close our prayers now. We will join in the Lord's Prayer shortly, but we're just going to finish our, our service. <laughs> you go out you might like to uh, be saying that as well so let's pray all together our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And let's just give thanks for the collection as we remain in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for all that's been given for the work of this church uh, through our bank accounts, through the collection, through the website. We pray, Lord, that you would use all that has been given for the furtherance of your kingdom, that it might be used to demonstrate your love in this community and far beyond uh, for your glory and for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.
Brilliant. Would you like to look up? Um, I'm going to start our notices as we come towards the end of the service with some bands of marriage. Um, we've got three sets. I know we've got a few folk around who are involved in these ceremonies. We've got um, one or two online as well, so that's very exciting. So, uh, I publish the bands of marriage between Edward James Holstock and Elizabeth Lopez Belmonte, both of this parish. I publish the bands of marriage between Taran Manjanath and Lydia McGill, both of this parish. Actually, Lydia is of the parish of St. Faith's Winchester. And I publish the bands of marriage between Ryan Matthew Bishop and Hannah Lucy Ashton, and they are both of this parish. These three sets of bands are all for the third time of asking. And if anybody knows any reason why these people should not be married, then please let me know after the service. But why don't we pray for these couples now? Lord, thank you so much for all these couples. Uh, we pray that you would bless them in their preparations uh, and that, above all, you would be with them in their marriages that as they're married, they might be a great blessing to all those around, as well as to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to let you know that we have a wedding here in church next Saturday as well. Um, Richard and Susie are going to be married at one o'clock, uh, which is obviously really exciting. If you were thinking of nipping in for something, probably hold off for a moment, unless you want to join the wedding, in which case you're very welcome. Um, and we also got a baptism next Sunday, so we've got all sorts of things going on, which is really exciting. Um, we've also got a festival happening. Oh my goodness! It turned it started as a little social with a quite a good band, and it's turned into the Valley Park Life Festival. Now, listen, I need to. Most of you will know, I know, but uh, the Park Life Festival is a festival hold, held in Manchester every year, and I, I thought we'd slightly rip it off and call it the Valley Park Life Festival. Uh, <laughs> Our wonderful trombonist, Peter, who you've enjoyed him leading worship, he is part of a band called the Casbars. It's a ska band. Uh, it's really good fun. We've uh, enjoyed them before. And you're going to be doing a couple of sets, aren't you, later on in the evening? But we've also got uh, a few other guys who are going to be joining us, a few other activities. Uh, there's hopefully going to be a craft fair, some face painting and all the rest. It's really exciting, 18th of June. Uh, we'd love you all to come. Uh, we'd also love a little bit of help, please. Uh, just with the setting up, the setting down, um, and some cake making, right? Thank you. Um, if you can help us, could you give Peter a shout uh, at the end, drop me an email, whatever, but it would be really great. Um, and the more help we have, the more we can do around the edges of this, uh, as you can imagine. It's a simple equation of resourcing, but we're pretty excited. We know it's going to be a really fun time. Um, and, uh, you know, we, here at St. Francis, we absolutely love welcoming people. Hospitality just runs in the DNA of this place. Uh, we also like a good party. It might just be the vicar. I don't think it is. Um, but it's going to be really fun. I'm really excited about it. But it would be great if you could just lend a hand just for one day, right? Uh, so uh, give Peter a shout at the end or me or whatever. Thank you so much. What else to say? Cafe's on at you as usual this week. There's communion at cafe at 12 tomorrow. So if you'd value midweek communion, uh, you'd be really welcome to pop in. Uh, apart from that, all our notices are in our newsletter that goes out every week. Uh, it's usually on the website. Had a bit of trouble with the tech. Never mind, I'll get it sorted. But you can find uh, a hard copy on the table at the back, which has got a big a sort of a, a summary of the major points. So do grab one of those or look on the website. That is definitely enough notices. What we're going we're gonna to sing our final song in a moment. Uh, when the service is finished, if you would like to see what it was like to jump out of a plane, we're going to show a two-minute video of me and Cliff jumping out of a plane. So just stay here. If you're watching on Zoom and hoping for Zoom rooms, they'll just happen after that. It's only two minutes, don't worry. Uh, and Zoom rooms will happen after that. Uh, also, coffee will happen after that, just uh, outside. So uh, we'd love it if you'd stay for a coffee. You're really welcome. Uh, and there's obviously tea and other hot drinks uh, available as well. Um, but if anyone would like, uh, if, if, if what I've spoken about today has raised questions um, and you'd like uh, to ask more or to have a chat, uh, to ask for prayer, then do grab myself or Cliff uh, at the end of the service or Fiona, I know, would be delighted to pray with you uh, and we would love to do that. So please don't miss that opportunity. And there's a service at six o'clock this evening, as I mentioned, uh, just an informal time of prayer and worship. Bring your own cuppa. Uh, brilliant.
So you're there. Why don't we sing our final song, uh, a wonderful uh, hymn in Christ alone. Let's stand as we sing together. final blessing. May Christ, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, draw you and all who hear his voice to be one flock within one fold. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those you love and pray for this day and always. Amen. So let's go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Mm -hmm.